Hi, I'm William Spaniel. Let's learn some game theory. Today we're going to investigate why there are antis in poker. And to do this, we're going to use a very simplified game. Here the dealer is going to give each player one card face down, and the players are only going to be able to look at what their card is. Simultaneously, these players will decide whether to bet or fold. If both bet, the players will flip over their cards and the high card will win. And the loser will pay the winner one dollar. Otherwise, if one, one side decides to fold or both sides decide to fold, then no money is going to exchange hands. Now, I've only taught you to solve games of complete information before, so this part about each player privately looking at his or her card might be a little disconcerting. You might be thinking to yourself that this rule creates private information, which breaks the whole concept of incomplete information that we've been using. Fortunately, however, the players don't actually learn anything about each other until after the game is over. That is, until after the cards have been flipped. So this might just as well be a simultaneous move game with complete information, and as such, we should be able to solve it. The next thing I want to draw your attention to is the bet or fold and high card wins parts. The two pieces of information here tell us how many pure strategies each player is going to have. We need to know this because we've only used matrices to solve simultaneous move games in the past. But sadly, we're going to run into some trouble if we try doing things like this. You might think that this isn't going to be that big of a deal because there are only two actions, better fold. And while you can only have two actions, better fold, there's this other big issue. And that's that there are 13 ranks of cards, starting with the lowly two and ending with the mighty ace. Our equilibrium strategies must tell us exactly what each player would do no matter what card is dealt to him. That is, we must know whether he will fold or bet a two, fold or bet a three, fold or bet a four, and so forth. We cannot just simply say better fold, as that would imply that the player is always either betting or folding, and that is not what we're trying to look at here. We're trying to go a little bit deeper than that. So how many pure strategies are there? Well, nature can deal 13 different cards, and there are two actions for every card. So for example, a pure strategy for this game is to fold everything, or fold two and bet everything else, or fold two, three, four, and eight and bet everything else, and so on. Given there are two strategies and 13 different types of cards, we're looking at 2 to the 13 number of strategies, or 8,192 strategies. And keep in mind that's just for one player. The second player has an equal number of strategies available, so there are 8,192 squared outcomes, which is 67,108,864 total outcomes. And it was hard enough doing a matrix like this in the safety and numbers games with six pure strategies apiece and 36 possible outcomes. But 67 million outcomes? I'm not even sure there's enough monitor space for that to fit on the screen. You probably don't have that number of pixels. So let's start thinking about possible strategies to see if we can narrow them down into an equilibrium without using that matrix. A lot of people are inclined to guess that you should only play the card if you are holding a card at least seven or higher. That's at least half as good as the rest of the cards in the deck. Think of it this way. You don't know what your opponent is holding, but there's a 50% chance they're holding something better than a six. As such, if you bet with a two, three, four, five, or six, you will probably lose more than half the time, so you probably don't want to play those cards. This gives both players a strategy of betting on seven or higher and folding the rest. <clears throat> And the payoffs here are going to be zero for both players. If both are playing card seven or higher, then both are equally likely to win. As such, the overall expected payoff for both players is going to be zero. Let me repeat that we're making this calculation before the cards are dealt. After you get your card, your expectation is going to change. For example, you will almost always win if you're dealt an ace. At worst, you will only draw if the unlikely event occurs that the other player was dealt an ace as well. Meanwhile, if you're dealt a 7, you'll almost always lose. At best, you'll only draw if your opponent has a 7 as well. And this last point is going to be pretty important. Consider that last point. It appears that player 1 has a profitable deviation. If he decides to bet everything 8 or higher, he can now expect to earn some positive amount of profit. Think of it this way. Every time that player 2 is dealt a 7, she will lose. The rest of the time, on average, the two players will draw. Thus, player 1 can make more money by changing his strategies, so the bet on 7 or higher set of strategies for both players is not going to be in equilibrium. Basically, what we're seeing here is that playing all cards that are going to be at least half as good as the other cards in the deck fails because it does not take into account what the other player might want to do. And we'll see that factoring in your opponent's play actually narrows what cards you are willing to play in an equilibrium. Now let's consider what happens if player 1 bets everything 8 or higher and folds the rest. 
since this game is zero sum, player two must now be losing money on average. So you might be wondering why she doesn't just match player one's strategy. And you're right, she could. That would make her pay off zero on average, which is better than some negative number. But why not just bet everything nine or higher instead? Now whenever player one has an eight, player two will win, and they will split the rest of their hands on average. This means player two can now expect a positive payoff overall, which is better than had she bet everything eight or higher and ended up with an average payoff of zero. Now we go back to looking at whether player one might want to switch his strategy. And sure enough, switching to betting everything 10 or higher works better. After making this change, player one earns a positive payoff, while player two is back into the negative. And we can actually use this logic all the way up until we get to a king and an ace. If player one bets on ace and player two bets on king or ace, player one draws when player two has an ace and wins when she has a king. Thus, his payoff is going to be positive and her payoff is going to be negative. But if player two switches to aces only, just like player one, they will only draw, and she can't do better than that. Meanwhile, player one cannot profitably deviate either. Choosing to bet any other card will make his payoff negative, while folding everything keeps his utility at zero. So he doesn't have a profitable deviation. And thus this is an equilibrium. Neither side has incentive to deviate from their strategies listed, betting on aces and aces only. But there are actually a few more equilibria that might not be so obvious. If player 1 folds everything and player 2 only bets on ace, neither side has a profitable deviation here either. To see this, note that if player 1 bets on anything other than an ace, he will lose money. And if he only bets on an ace, he will still be making zero. That is not a profitable deviation, it's an equal deviation. So player 1 can keep his strategy where it is. Meanwhile, player 2 loses money if she starts betting on cards other than an ace, and she will make zero if she folds everything. Thus, she has no profitable deviation either, and this is an equilibrium. Third, we can just flip-flop these strategies, and for the reasons we just discussed, neither side has incentive to deviate, and this is an equilibrium too. Lastly, if both fold everything, the game never really takes place, and no one is going to bet, and thus everyone's going to get zero, and no one has incentive to deviate, no one can profitably deviate from there, and so this is going to be an equilibrium as well. So we have our fourth equilibrium. So let's get back to discussing why antis exist. In equilibrium, players only bet if they have the best hand possible, if they even bet at all. They might just not play. They could bet everything, and then you have no game. That's going to be pretty boring. We don't want to see that. We want to see players taking risks, because that's entertaining and it's more fun. Even if you're playing the game, it's not going to be very much fun if you're just folding everything or only playing aces. You want to have action. So the solution is to actually force action by making players commit money to the pot ahead of time, by making antis, essentially. Now, if players fold most, uh, fold most of their hands, they will actually lose a lot of money. And that's what's going to keep poker interesting, it will keep the play going. And that's why we have antis in poker.